Hello, everyone, and welcome to a special educational event on Full Life Empty Trash Bin, or How and Why to Choose Sustainable Consumption Over Wasteful Consumerism. So we're really excited about this event. We've got some terrific speakers lined up for you today. Before we start, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Your registration fee covers only a proportion of our expenses, and so um, we rely on the generosity of these sponsors to keep this show on the virtual road. Today we are sponsored by Recology Sonoma Marin, Marin Sanitary Service, Tamil Pius Community Services District, The Wild Minimalist, and Wisdom Supply Company. So thank you to all of those um, sponsors. So our event, we called it Full Life Empty Trash Bin. It's kind of a nod to the fact that becoming aware of it, that becoming aware of waste and reducing it is not just an environmental issue, it's also a quality of life issue. It's about prioritizing and freeing up time and resources for what matters most in life. It's actually, as such, you know, it's part of a really long tradition that goes, embraces people and cultures from monks in Tibet to Marie Kondo. So to, because of that, that desire to include the sort of broader focus of waste, that's the structure of our event today. We're gonna to be having, first we have Kim Shibley, who will talk to us about uh, what waste looks like today, you know, where, where those trash trucks go, what happens next, and what happens on a global level. Then after she speaks, we'll have a presentation by Lily Cameron, who will be talking about how you can achieve a lower waste lifestyle yourself. And then after uh, both our speakers have made their presentations, we're going to have a Q&A with moderator Garen Kazanjian, as I already mentioned, and then we're going to wrap up. So, Kim Shibley, is formerly the Director of Compliance and Customer Relations for Marin Sanitary Service. She holds degrees from the University of California, Davis, the University of San Francisco, and UCSF, and has certificates in sustainable practices from Dominican University and management and leadership from the California Refuse Recycling Council. So today, Kim is here to help us all understand what happens to waste. So where do those trash trucks go and what happens next? Welcome, Kim, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I wish I could see everyone in the audience. Um, one day, I'm sure I will again. Um, next slide. So we have a very full agenda. I'm going to be talking about waste in Marin, then we're going to head over to what it looks like in California, and then look globally, um, talk about how the pandemic has affected waste and then move into food waste and bioplastics. It is a, we're gonna start in Marin County. And this slide shows on the left is the, the diversion rate and on the right is the pounds per person per day disposal rate. So that's what each person throws into their trash daily. So Marin many, many years ago uh, set zero waste goals to divert 94% of waste from the landfill by 2025. And, and at the time, it seemed like a really realistic goal. Um, the markets were strong. The haulers had some wonderful programs. And there were lots of plans to um, roll out even more programs. It looked like we could reach 80% diversion by 2020. And then we're well on our way to 94, uh, excuse me, 94% by 2025. Um, so why hasn't this happened? Um, was this a realistic goal? Uh, I'd like you to think keep kind of keep that question in the back of your mind as, as we go along. But there were also several other things that happened during this time period um, that kind of derailed this goal a little bit. There were lots of changes in the markets. Um, everybody's probably heard that China and other Asian um, uh, communities decided to get an environmental conscience and not accept our trash anymore, um, which was a, a, a big blow for everyone who sent all of their so-called recyclables overseas. The domestic markets are really few and far between. So that was another uh, big obstacle for the recycling industry. Um, wishful recycling has not helped. It's led to even more contamination and more landfilling of the recyclables. Uh, the reality that mixed material packaging, many types of plastic packaging that we were sending overseas was actually ending up in the landfills or in the environment was kind of a big blow to everyone. Uh, next slide. So 
So there, this is just a little bit about uh, all the haulers and the various programs that are offered in Marin County. Um, if you want to know more, really, this is very, very basic. For more specifics, I would really suggest that you go on to each of the haulers' websites, Zero Waste Marin, and see what actually is taken in your community that you live in. So there are five haulers. They all have recycling programs. They all have organics programs. Now, they might be slightly different, and there are a variety of reasons for that. The two biggest ones are where the material goes to be processed and who the buyers are for those materials. A couple of the haulers have dual stream programs. That's where the, the paper fibers are separated from the glass, plastic, metal, bottles, and cans. Um, everyone has organics programs, a, a co-collected food waste, yard waste, food soiled paper. Marin Sanitary Service also offers a unique food scrap only program that is source separated food from commercial businesses. Mill Valley Refuse participates in that program also. That food is sent to Central Marin Sanitation Agency where it is converted into um, a biogas that is turned into energy used to power the wastewater treatment facility. So, Everyone, most of Marin sends its uh, organic waste to WM Earth Care uh, Waste Management Facility in Novato. That is a facility that produces an orga organically certified um, soil amendments that are sold to farmers in organic farming. Because of that, bio bags and other bioplastics are not accepted at this facility. Um, Bay City Refuse sends its organic material, so that's Sausalito and some other little communities in Southern Marin, to the East Bay. Uh, they have a, a non-organic stream of soil amendments. They also have an organic stream. But because they have both, the bio bags can be accepted in their program. So next slide. Okay, now we're gonna go a little bigger. Uh, we're going to look at California's waste stream. So this is a 2018 Cal Recycle Waste Characterization Study. And as you can see, uh, organic still plays a big part of the waste in our landfills. So like Marin, the state of California has also seen a decline in its um, recycling rates since uh, 2020. We've had a decrease from 50% to around 40% now despite all the laws uh, that have gone into place since then. So organic material at, at 34%, about 12% of that is actually food waste. So the materials that generate all, the majority of greenhouse gases we have to remember are the organics and the paper, and that's about 50% of the overall waste stream. So unlike past waste characterization studies, this study actually uh, separated food waste out into eight separate categories. And it was looking to see the potentially edibility of this food. So the eight food waste categories include potentially don donatable material types to help inform measurement of potentially donatable or recoverable food that is disposed of in the landfills each year in order to determine the edible food baseline for Senate Bill 1383, which I'll talk to in, in a little bit. So. Who's making all this waste? Uh, the majority commercial sector. Um, residential sector came in, that includes multifamily uh, at around 29%. Uh, self haul made up the, the remaining amount. Um, this is a, a lovely 180 page document and it was released May 15, 2020 and is available on the Cal Recycle website if you, are, you have insomnia and would like some more reading. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so, so why is organic waste in a landfill so bad? Uh, can't we just capture all that gas? Yes, we can. Not all of it, maybe. Um, it still does a lot of harm. This uh, organic landfill generates methane, which we all know is far more po potent than carbon dioxide. Some say it's about 72 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And our landfills are responsible for about 21% of the state's uh, methane emissions. Landfills everywhere are about uh, are the third largest producer of methane. 
And all of this is leading to our current climate crisis, and we're all feeling the negative effects. We're having longer droughts, warmer temperatures, increased number of wildfires, bigger storms. Um, the coast is eroding due to rising sea levels, and, and that's just naming a few of the problems. Um, landfilling of organic waste is also a major source of local air quality pollutants, and that causes all kinds of, of health issues as well. Next slide. <laughs> okay, so to help combat these issues, um, California passed well, several laws, and these were aimed uh, at, at preventing waste from ending up in the landfill and also reducing the global warming gases that are potent and short-lived, short uh, just methane. So the first bill, Assembly Bill 341, was passed in 2012, and that was for mandatory commercial recycling. And the goal was that 75% of all solid waste generated would either be reduced, reused, recycled, or composted by 2020. Uh, it, again, seemed like a realistic goal at the moment. Assembly, Assembly Bill 1826 came along next, and that made commercial organics collection mandatory and moved the focus over to greenhouse gas emissions reduction as part of the AB32 scoping plan. And that is the California, California Global Warming Solutions Act of 2020, excuse me, 2006, moving into the future now. So the next two laws, or the, that these two laws um, basically mandated to jurisdictions that they have these programs aimed at the commercial sector since they produce the majority of, of waste. Um, it mandated programs, um, but it gave the option to enforce compliance. Most, uh, most cities and um, municipalities around California chose to not go that option. They were hoping that people would just do the right thing and sign on and recycle. Um, Senate Bill 1383 is gonna be a game changer. We'll talk about it in a different slide. Um, the, next, the next two bills though are uh, bills that kind of aren't on everybody's radars, but really I, I think for this group, it's something you all should look into. Um, AB 1583 established a statewide commission on recycling markets and curbside recycling. And this was to provide CalRecycle, the legislature and other state or federal agencies um, information regarding the state's ambitious recycling and organics recovery goals from the perspective, get this, of people who actually work in the industry. That was a big one. Uh, the next bill then, uh, established some guidelines on what they wanted this, this commission to do. So the first one was uh, were to uh, issue preliminary recommendations on or before January 1, 2021, which they did on uh, December 21st of uh, 2020. They released their first preliminary report. It is a great report. Um, it's a short 96 pages. And again, it is on CalRecycle's website. So the next phase of that group is uh, to issue policy recommendations and identify products that are recyclable and compostable or compostable um, and regularly collected in curbside recycling programs by July 1, 2021. So I would urge you to really stay tuned for uh, to those the, uh, the commission's reports. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is uh, Senate Bill 1383. So this is the short-lived climate pollutants, organic waste, methane emissions <laughs> reduction act. Whew, that's a mouthful. SB 1383. So the first thing it did was establish, this was passed in 2016, but it doesn't go into effect until January 1, 2022. So next year. Um, it set the target goal that we would reduce uh, landfill organic waste by 50% by 2020. Okay, oops, we missed that target. We still have opportunities. 
uh, and hopefully now that SB 1383 has big penalties for non-compliance for all of us, generators, uh, haulers, processors, uh, everybody. Everybody has a little bit of skin in this game now. Um, so we're hoping, they're hoping that by 2025, we'll have a 75% reduction in landfill organic waste and that this will result in a reduction of 4 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions annually by 2030. Um, additionally, a big part of this is they set targets for edible food recovery, and they want to um, recover at least 20% of all edible food that goes into the landfill now. Next slide, please. Okay, here we go. Now we're moving around the world, moving out even more. Um, I was asked to, to talk about some other model um, countries around the world and what are they doing that, that works so well and why. So these are the top five, Germany, Austria, South Korea, Wales, Switzerland. It, it actually depends on what list you look at. Germany seems to always top the list, but the other four kind of move around. Um, the one thing that they all have in common is that um, they've been able to implement this uh, countrywide. It, it wasn't little cities and towns within the country doing their own thing. The other thing to, that we should all be aware of is these countries also rely heavily on incineration. Um, and that is one of their waste management strategies. Germany, uh, incinerates about 22%, Austria 35%, South Korea 24%, Wales 21%, although that's a UK figure, so Wales is probably a little lower than that. And Switzerland is about half, 49% um, of the waste they generate gets incinerated. So I also wanna give a shout out to Taiwan because this is really one of the most creative recycling programs I've ever seen. Um, they have big, colorful garbage trucks that go all around blasting classical music to remind people to bring their recycling out to the truck. Love that idea. Okay, next slide. Please. Okay, so this is the German model. And really, it, it, it is a, a, a wonderful model. Um, what they did first was in 1990 did this extensive packaging audit, and they looked at all packaging. Um, to see how they could keep it out of the landfill. And from this came three really important policies. The packaging ordinance, um, and this required manufacturers to take responsibility for the recycling of their product packaging after a consumer was finished using it. So this included transportation packaging, secondary packaging, like the box around the soda cans, and primary packaging, the soda can itself. Uh, the next was a closed substance Cycle and Waste Management Act. And this applies to anyone who produces, markets, or consumes goods and dictates that they are responsible, responsible for the materials, reuse, recycling, or environmentally sound disposal. Um, and then, then third was establishment of a program called the Green Dot Program. And this is basically a green dot goes on all the products. And that lets uh, people know that that material is going to be disposed of in, in, a, in a proper manner. Um, the companies using the green dot have promised to abide by all of Germany's recycling laws and they actually pay into this system. So over the years, these three policies have really increased um, Germany's uh, recycling rate. Uh, they are, last I, I read, they were in the upper 60s. Um, when they first started this, they, they weren't that bad off. They were in the 50s. Um, but what it's also done is really, really instilled in its citizen this strong culture of wanting to keep resources out of the landfill. Um, the next slide, please. Okay, so you can't talk about the best without talking about the worst. And this is kind of to make the United States feel a little better because there are plenty of people doing a worse job than us. Chile, Turkey, 1% recycling rate. Woo! Lots of opportunities for improvement. Mexico, 3 to 5%. Russia and Slovakia, 
the numbers bounce around, but they're all less than 10%. So uh, where is the United States fall in to all of this? Well, as far as all the countries go, the United States is around 19. Again, that number moves around depending on where you uh, where your source is. Um, the United States has been in the 30s, 30% 30 recycling rate for a number of years now. We can't seem to move um, ahead of that easily. So various studies show the US is the biggest generator of waste and only about one third of what we, what we throw away or what we dispose of gets recycled. But also we, we incinerate a lot also. And that's around 10, 12% of our waste in the United States, not in California, but in the United States is, is still incinerated. I know this kind of paints a bleak picture of the US versus uh, many of the European Union countries, but there is hope. There is a lot, there are a lot more states passing legislation about recycling and composting. And there's a new federal bill in Congress that actually might be a game changer. Um, next slide, please. So this is the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. And um, this is, like I said, at the, it's, it's a federal uh, bill. Um, and if you want to learn more about it, I urge you, they're having a webinar uh, Wednesday, March 31st at 2 p.m. You can go on their website and register and listen in and learn more. Um, is it a perfect bill? No but I, I really think it's a really good starting point. And this requires big corporations to take responsibility for their pollution, requiring producers of plastic products to design, manage, and finance race, waste and recycling programs. Um, hopefully it'll spur innovation, incentivizing big corporations to make reusable products and items that can easily be and actually be recycled. Um, the hope is to create a nationwide beverage container refund program, similar to the one in California. Uh, it will reduce and even ban certain single-use plastic products that are truly not recyclable. It'll establish a minimum content, a recycled content for beverage containers, packaging, and all food service products. And the big thing is it's going to hopefully spur uh, massive investments in U.S. domestic recycling um, and composting infrastructure, which is really huge. That's when China hit us with the, we don't want to take any of your garbage anymore. We realized, oh, oh goodness, we have nowhere to send it in the United States. There really just is not a, a domestic infrastructure present. Um, so it, the, the other thing it will do is put push the pause button on any new plastics facilities until critical environment and health protections are put in place. So that's a good thing. So again, tune in March 31st uh, at 2 p.m. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, I think we have a little bit of time to talk about COVID. Um, I just have one slide. You've probably been hearing um, the pandemic has had a big impact on the waste stream, um, what's discarded and how it's disposed. So this slide is actually, I apologize that it's a little blurry. I, I put the, um, the article that I, I took the, the graphs out of uh, Waste 360. And this was a, a study done by the Environmental Research and Education Foundation in conjunction with the National Waste and Recycling Association. And basically what shows on the left, that big blue area is residential waste. And that has shot way up 70, 80%. Um, there's a lot more cardboard. There's a lot more plastics. You know, uh, there's a lot more online shopping, takeout food containers, um, uh, PPE, personal protective equipment going into the landfills. Another reason for this is that a lot of municipalities um, who were concerned about health reasons, put their, their recycling programs completely on pause. So all they were offering was landfill service. So that's kind of another reason why that waste stream was impacted so, so much more. Um, there was a de decrease, surprisingly, in the commercial sector, or not surprisingly. You know, if, if you can't have your business open, you can't generate waste. But also we have nothing fun to do, so that was kind of a bummer. Um, Next slide, please. 
Okay. So if you thought the pandemic was a downer, this statement really brings me down. This is uh, the UN um, released this statement. Nearly half of all fruit and vegetables produced globally are wasted each year. Next slide, please. Okay, food is the, one of the largest components taking up landfill space, as we talked about. And guess what? The United States is the leader. No, we don't want to be the leader in this. Um, we are discarding nearly 40 million tons of food waste every year. That's 80 billion pounds. Uh, that's about $161 billion. And annually, now these statistics change also depending on where you look. Uh, it's about, you know, approximately 219 pounds of food per person. Um, other studies have shown it's as high as one pound per person per day of, of food waste, which is crazy. So there's about 30 to 40% of the food, U.S. food supply. Research has also found that people who have healthier diets, rich in fruits and vegetables, are the most wasteful. Oh, my goodness. Um, that was shocking to me. Um, and the number one reason for that is we perceive it to be spoiled or out of date or it looks bad. So we toss it. Fruits and vegetables are tossed the most, followed by dairy and meat. And this is really, really sad. So hopefully Lily can uh, boost us all up and help us be part of the solution going forward. So this is also taking a, a, a major um, environmental toll as we as we've talked about. Next slide, please. Okay, we're nearing the end, I promise. Um, so one of the things that's been discussed was with food waste is, well, how, what can we do to help capture this food a little bit more? Um, well, bioplastics is something that's been tossed around, whether it's the bio bag or the, uh, the pla compostable plastic takeout containers, um, you know, is it a problem? Is it a solution? So the public tends to love them. Um, it helps remove the ick factor and we get to feel warm and fuzzy that we're buying a product that is not petroleum based. But there are many issues uh, surrounding bioplastics use in the organic stream. And uh, they're on this slide, contamination, compostability standards. They're not breaking down like they said they would. Um, and also a limited end market for compost, uh, finished compost that has those materials in them. Next slide, please. So this is a, uh, um, actually, back one, please. Okay, here we go. So uh, bio, uh, BioCycle and the Biodegradable Plastics or Products Institute, BPI, actually convened a really impro important uh, group of stakeholders together to identify action steps towards broader acceptance and processing of these materials. This is their new roadmap, they called it, and it, it tackles a lot of these barriers. These are just questions that they asked, um, you know, the composting industry, hey, do you really want to be a part of this effort? And then the producers, hey, do you want to be a really a, a part of this, this solution too? And the whole goal was increased organic diversion via, via a single set of acceptable criteria for compostable products. So that, again, is in BioCycle. Um, in their ma online magazine, March 16, 21, read the article, it's great. Next slide, please. Okay. So this uh, basically was the, the, the problem statement that BPI put out saying, compostable products and packaging exist to facilitate the diversion of food scraps from landfills, but the products and packaging themselves must also be diverted from the landfills of zero waste value proposition that affects food service operators, brands and users and consumers to them is to be realized. The treatment of key barriers in these working sessions and for BPI more broadly assumes that the screening out of compostable products before processing is not a viable solution in the long term, though it may be a practical one in the short term. It may also be the best indicator of how challenging these barriers have become for some composters and will hopefully uh, bring increased urgency to the work ahead. So next slide, please. Okay, and this is our, our last slide because this really is what the, the group came together and, and came up with. Hopefully they'll have their final plan ready for implementation in 2026, but they're tackling four big areas, regulatory action, 
um, product labeling action, field validation um, of, of testing methods and awareness and education. So tune in there. Um, there's a lot of really good things happening and a lot of, of um, stakeholders coming together to actually work on solutions for the first time, I, I think in, in our history. Um, next slide. Oh, and that's it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kim. I, I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea how complex the, the waste stream landscape is. And that was an amazing, and I know we, we kept you to a short period of time, but you covered a lot and there's a lot to follow up on. Thank you so much for your time and expertise today. I think we all have um, a better sense of the big picture of what recycling and waste management is about right now and how there seems to be a real opportunity for change going on, which is tremendous. Because as your uh, presentation made really clear, we do need to change. We need to change a lot. So um, our next speaker will be helping us out with that because she, Lily Cameron is passionate about living a minimalist, zero waste lifestyle and helping others to do the same. Uh, she does that kind of in three ways. First of all, it's her store, The Wild Minimalist, which makes it easier for people to transition to a lower waste lifestyle. She also blogs about the journey her family is taking to um, a sort of more minimal, zero plastic, zero waste environment, because we all know that's difficult to do. You're really going against the trend of our current consumer society when you do that. And finally, she's also uh, just released a book called Simply Sustainable. So while Kim told you what happens when you throw stuff away, Lily is here to help inspire you with information and ideas on reducing the amount of waste that you bring into your home before it starts. So welcome, Lily. We look forward to hearing from you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I'm Lily Cameron. I am the founder of Wild Minimalist and the author of Simply Sustainable, which comes out next week. Um, it's all about the joys of low waste living, which is something we're going to talk about today. I'm going to start by taking a poll and asking the audience, how much waste do you think the average American creates per day? So if you entered 4.9 pounds per day. Unfortunately, you are correct. A lot of realists slash pessimists in this audience. But as of 2018, that is the number. And I'm a little afraid of what it is in 2020, 2021, after hearing Kim's presentation today about the effects of COVID. Um, but just to give you a benchmark to compare that to, in 1960, the average American created about 2.61, 2.68 pounds of trash per day. So obviously there's a number of factors that go into that, um, that account for that huge increase in waste over the last 60 years. One is the popularity of plastic packaging um, and e-commerce, but we're gonna look at some solutions to help reduce that household waste today. Okay, so this is my family, my husband, Max, our son, Grant, who is almost uh, turning three years old, just to give you an idea of how old this picture is. Not pictured is our very adorable dachshund, Lola. Um, and about five years ago, my family and I decided to switch to a low waste lifestyle. We were really concerned about the effects of climate change, of course, living in California, the California wildfires, um, plastic pollution in general, and just really wanted to do our part to reduce waste as much as possible. Next slide. So we've been able to do this. We've been able to be pretty successful reducing waste by following the five R's of zero waste. And I think some people hear zero waste and it can sound really intimidating and stressful. You might think that our family doesn't have a garbage or we keep all of our trash in a jar for the year. Um, that is not the case. And sadly with COVID, um, we also are producing waste. But really I define zero waste as taking gradual intentional steps to reduce the waste that you send to landfill. So the important thing here is making progress and not perfection. 
But as you can see, the zero waste hierarchy, this inverted triangle, the order is intentional. So one thing people are sometimes surprised by is that recycle is one of the least effective ways to reduce waste. If we are following the zero waste hierarchy, we are going to actually be recycling uh, less and not more. Next slide, please. So the first R of zero waste refuse is actually really simple. Um, if we prevent disposable products from entering our home, we are gonna create very little trash. So some ways that we can do this, um, refusing plastic bags, bringing our own reusable bags, um, declining plastic straws and cutlery. If you're lucky enough to find out, um, bringing our own. Also, um, don't get our coffee in to-go cups. Um, to, uh, coffee cups are actually disposable. They cannot be recycled, unfortunately. Um, so we make our own coffee and tea at home. And then we really try to avoid um, accepting any freebies into our home. And freebies are sort of that broad category um, of items. So business cards, junk mail, branded tote bags, beauty samples, food samples, the little goodie bag that your dentist offers you at the end of your cleaning. Um, and it can feel a little bit uncomfortable at first to say no to these free items because we've been conditioned to say yes, it feels impolite at first. But when we accept those items, we are reinforcing the demand for these disposable products. So have those uncomfortable conversations. Next slide, please. Okay, the second R of zero waste, reduce. One of the first projects our family did when we were switching to a low waste lifestyle was to declutter our home and to do it really thoughtfully and really just cultivate the items that we were using on a daily basis. Um, so the reason that this is important is that it not only frees up valuable space in your home, but it also frees up your time and attention. So you can care for the items that you truly do value and, and need and use daily. It also trains us to become a more mindful consumer. So we're much more likely to be cautious with new purchases. And one thing that I really recommend, um, an easy way to start is to delay purchases. When you have that impulse to shop or buy something new, delay that purchase by a day. Uh, you can even challenge yourself to a week long or a month long spending freeze. And oftentimes after that period has passed, we realize that we no longer need that item or we found something else that could work instead or we could borrow it from a neighbor. This also gives us the opportunity to pre-cycle and consider what material that new item is made from is made from and what is going to happen to it at the end of its useful life. Um, and of course, another way that we can reduce is by conserving resources, taking a shorter showers, switching to LED bulbs when our old bulbs um, burn out and walking and biking more instead of driving in a car. Next slide, please. So the third R of zero waste, um, as disposable products ran out in our home, plastic sandwich bags, cling wrap, paper towels, we slowly started to integrate more and more reusable products. So one example is a wood dish brush. When we were done, with our plastic sponge, we switch to this great wood dish brush. And unlike a plastic sponge, it is reusable. So when the head of the brush becomes no longer usable after a long time, I can swap that out for a new one and that handle can be reused again. Um, and all the parts are recyclable or compostable at the end of life. Another way that we can reuse is by finding a new use for items that we would typically discard or throw away or recycle. So an example of this might be saving glass jars from your recycling and using them to propagate plants or 
taking an old bath towel and cutting it up to um, make cleaning rags. Another way that we can reuse is by buying used items. When we buy secondhand, we are help giving new life to these used products that might have ended up in a landfill. So um, we're also reducing the demand for uh, the new products, the materials that go into them and the environmental costs. So the, um, what the product's made from, how it was packaged, you're not gonna get the packaging with a new product um, and usually you're buying it locally. So you're not having it shipped over long distances. Next slide, please. Okay, the fourth R zero waste, recycle. There is a great saying about recycling. It is a great place to start and bad place to stop. Um, one thing that I always try to um, talk about a lot is that we need to do our part to avoid wish cycling, something that Kim talked a little bit about today. Um, I think it's estimated that one in four items in your recycling bin do not belong. Um, and wish cycling is really something that many of us are guilty of. I, I've done it before. Um, you have an item in question, you aren't really sure if it's recyclable, so you try to recycle it and you just really cross your fingers that some nice person is going to take care of it for you. Um, the problem with this is that I learned is that you can actually contaminate an entire bin or truckload of recyclables and send everything to the landfill. Um, you can also clog or break recycling equipment and slow down operations. So something that I definitely recommend, um, visit your local sanitation website. We belong to Marin Sanitary. They have a super helpful tool. You can type in a, an item and it'll tell you which cart it belongs in. Um, in terms of recyclable materials and packaging, glass and metal are two of my favorites because they can be recycled indefinitely without a loss of quality. Whereas plastic is something we really try to um, avoid at all costs because it can usually only be downcycled. So a plastic water bottle will likely never turn into a new plastic water bottle. It might be turned into plastic carpet fiber or the fleece for a jacket. So you're really just delaying the time that that plastic is going to go to a landfill. Next slide, please. Okay, final R of zero waste. So rot or composting. If you don't already, I highly recommend you start composting. It's estimated that 30% of household waste can be composted. Um, and this includes, of course, food scraps, eggshells, coffee grounds, um, but also paper towels and napkins. One thing I was sort of surprised to discover um, if you have a greasy pizza box, it belongs in your compost bin. Um, if you put it in recycling, that can lead to recycling contamination. So um, if I also have like a paper bag from takeout or a pastry bag, as long as it's made from 100% paper um, and it's greasy, I will crumple that up and put it into my compost. Okay, next slide. All right, we have come to another poll question and I wanted to ask the audience, what do you think is the most wasted material in a uh, landfill? And this is nationally. Everyone has entered their answer. Most popular answer was food and you are correct. So I think everyone was paying attention to Kim's presentation, yay. Um, also sad though, because as we know, food creates um, methane gas when it's sent to a landfill. It unfortunately usually does not biodegrade. Um, and it definitely did surprise me. Um, everyone seems very savvy on what's the most wasted material in, in landfill, but I always thought it was plastic because we all hear about how bad plastic is, but it turns out that we waste an incredible amount of food in the United States. Um, it's estimated, I believe, that a family of four throws away $1,800 worth of groceries every year. So we're going to look at a few ways at home that we can help to reduce 
reduce that food waste. Okay, great. Um, so starting with the pantry, this is a picture of our pantry. And um, just to give you a little backstory, I really had to fight our contract to do these exposed open shelves. He really insisted that we needed a walk-in pantry, closed doors, hide the unsightly mess that is that are most pantries. Um, but I really wanted these exposed shelves so that I could see my pantry staples at a glance every time that I go into the kitchen um, and really keeping it organized. Um, I try to buy all of these foods in bulk, which is a little bit more challenging during COVID, unfortunately, but cross fingers that it'll come back again. Um, but not only can I see at a glance what I'm getting low on, I'm not going to, you know, lose something. I'm not going to forget or discover a sad bag of hemp seeds somewhere in a corner um, when I can see everything right away. So a great way to keep things visible is by storing these pantry items in uh, glass jars. They're transparent. Um, I highly recommend airtight jars with a rubber gasket. That's going to help prevent moisture and pets from coming in and help preserve those dry goods for longer. Um, another way that I reduce food waste, um, at the beginning of the week when I'm getting ready to go grocery shopping, I will take a survey of what I have in my pantry and my fridge. And I will try to incorporate as many foods as possible that I already have. So I call this shopping my pantry and fridge. Um, and it's a really great challenge, a great way to use up foods and also challenges me to become a more creative cook. Okay, next slide. In terms of the fridge, one thing that's really helpful to reduce waste is practicing the FIFO rule, the first in, first out rule. And if you have ever worked in the restaurant industry, this is something you're probably already familiar with. But basically the FIFO rule, you place foods that are more perishable or older towards the front of your fridge. Um, ideally at eye level. And the reason is so that when you open your fridge, you know right away, oh, I need to use that up first before I move on to the new foods in my fridge. Um, another thing that I like to do is to create zones in my fridge. This helps keep things organized. I know where to find things so nothing gets lost. Um, on our top shelf, I usually have breakfast staples. Um, middle shelf, I'll have leftovers, snacks, a fruit basket to remind me to eat my fruit. Um, and then the bottom shelves are usually a hodgepodge of produce um, as well as the crisper drawers. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, wait, sorry, go back a slide. <sighs> Forgot one thing. Okay, the last thing I wanted to talk about is um, that there are really great ways to preserve foods without using plastic waste. It turns out that plastic is not a great material for preserving um, produce like leafy greens, uh, herbs. If you've ever discovered that super sad, depressing bag of slimy spinach or cilantro in your crisper drawer, um, this is for you. So one thing I really love is using a cotton produce storage bag. Um, that's, those are those um, white items with the green and yellow trim in the fridge you can see there. Those are really great for allowing your produce to breathe while keeping it um, hydrated, wicking away moisture, and, and it helps to ensure that those items stay really crisp and fresh, fresh for longer. Um, another item that I have are um, glass jars, of course, um, and also a set of glass storage containers. So um, this, again, it's helpful because it's, it's visible, it's transparent. I can see at a glance what I have. Um, they're great for storing leftovers, but also produce. I use it to store berries, mushrooms, carrots. It keeps it really cr crisp and fresh for longer. You do not need plastic to store those items. Um, you can see my asparagus arrangement in the corner. It keeps the stalks really crisp and fresh, storing them in water like that. 
Um, and the final item that we use um, are beeswax cloths. So that's a really great replacement for plastic cling wrap. You can preserve half a melon or avocado um, and keep it, um, help it last longer without the plastic waste. Okay, last slide, I believe. Sorry, next slide, last slide. Oh, great. Um, so the last thing I wanted to talk about is finding creative ways to use your food scraps. Um, one thing I really love doing at our home, I have a silicone storage bag that I keep in the freezer and I add to it throughout the week while I'm cooking. So I will save the tops of mushrooms, carrot peels, carrot ends, celery, uh, the ends of leek, um, what else, herbs, onions, uh, skins of potatoes, really all the scraps that you, you, you create while you're cooking, you can turn that into a super flavor, flavorful, fresh broth. Um, we do that about like once every week, two weeks, and then we use that to cook and create soups, risotto, sauces um, for the next week. So really great way to use up your food scraps and you can avoid buying those plastic cartons of vegetable stock at the grocery store. Um, some other ideas are using the ends of carrots. I think you can also do radish greens and you can turn that into a pesto with some nuts and herbs um, and olive oil. Also, if you're juicing a lot of citrus, um, lemons, oranges, grapefruit. Um, don't forget the peel of the orange. Um, using the zest for baking is a really great way to get more use out of that product. You can use the peels to infuse your homemade all-purpose cleaner. So, um, you know, giving it a little extra life there for citrus. And of course, stale bread, um, you can turn that into breadcrumbs. Okay, I think that is all I have time for. Last slide. Uh, just wanted to say thank you. And if you want to learn more about low waste living, um, you can visit our blog at Wild Minimalist or check out my new book, Simply Sustainable. Thank you so much, Lily. There's so much information there and you ran out of time and I know you could have just kept talking because, you know, there's so many layers when you, I, I like how you said it's not Zero waste is not really a goal in itself. It's not that achievable, but the journey really makes a difference. And it, it gets complex. There are layers to it and things you don't even think you can do the first time around. And a few months later, you're like, no, that's not a big deal. I can easily do that too. So I really appreciate that. Um, I have checked out your blog. I think it's really very informative and fun. And I've learned a lot from that too. So I urge people to check out the blog, go to the store, read the book, do what you can, because I think what we can, you know, all of us can make some difference, even if it doesn't make a huge difference to our landfill near us. I think it makes a difference to our own quality of life and it really helps us live our intentions and values. So that's, there's a lot of value to that as well. Aaron Kazanjian is our, going to moderate our conversation here. He's a, your business card confuses me, a waste zero specialist. Okay, he's a waste zero specialist at Recology Sonoma Marin. So in that role, he spends his time educating businesses on how to properly divert their waste and how to, and he sets up commercial customers with compost and recycling services. He also knows that trash does not stop at the curb or at the dump. He has a passion for politics and government, um, served as a staff member for the California, in the California legislature prior to joining Recology. And he, in his current job, he regularly attends Marin County Solid Waste JPA local task force meetings and serves on the Nevada Chamber of Commerce uh, Government Affairs Committee. So, Garen, thank you so much for joining us today to moderate this discussion. And how do you want to start? And Christine, I really appreciate it. And thank you to our panelists, Kim and Lily. That was uh, really exciting. I know I learned a ton. I, I feel like I'm always learning. Kim basically taught me the waste industry from the ground up. So, uh, you know, it's really interesting to be able to even keep learning more and more. And, and it's interesting to see the two sides of this too. There's really the disposal side and there's the side that happens before disposal um, and, and how to keep things from being disposed or properly disposed in the first place. So really, I'm just gonna dive into these questions and feel free to keep adding them. We have this function again, that we'll be able to add and dismiss questions, but there were some great ones on there and there'll be, I promise, no favoritism. 
So the first question that I saw that I really liked was uh, really relevant because uh, we're basically entering a state of drought again. I know you remember, we have fond memories of a couple of years ago of needing to reduce the amount of water that we are using. And the question is, if these recyclables need to be so clean, how much water do I need to use when I'm recycling them? Uh, is that a good use of water? Um, and Kim, I thought maybe that you could speak a little bit in the post-processing of how clean should recyclables be? Well, the cleaner, the better. Um, I wouldn't want you to put them in your dishwasher and like my mother and then put them into the <laughs> recycling container. Um, but there are a lot of other materials that we can use to wipe them out. You've used a, a paper napkin, use that to wipe out the inside of, of a can or a peanut butter jar or whatever. Um, you have leftover dishwater, use that to rinse out things before you put them into the container. So you just don't want them full of food and slime. Try and get the most uh, of the material out that you can. Excellent. Very good. And, you know, I think it's a, a great use of water to me. Uh, you know, it really doesn't need to be that much water. Next up, I'm going to go back up towards the top. Uh, there was a quick question about what's the difference between methane gas and natural gas? Uh, and and uh, I actually did a little bit of research and found out that natural gas is really a catch-all that contains primarily 70 to 90 percent methane. It's considered a little bit dirtier, but I wanted to address that really quickly. Next up, I have a question, uh, and this I think is a little bit better for Lily. It says that pre, you know, before we had plastics, before we developed plastics, one, what were people using in the first place? Uh, why did we switch to plastics? And is there an advantage or a disadvantage of switching back to some of those methods like glass? And why, why aren't manufacturers doing that? Yeah, uh, hard to, you know, back. So it was around the 1960s that uh, plastic became so popular and you really saw that huge transition um, in grocery stores, you know, offering plastic bags, packaging, turning into plastic. I do believe, I have to admit, I was not around in the 60s, but I do believe that packaging was mostly uh, glass, paper, cardboard. Um, so I do think that there's actually been a huge movement to return to those items as, be as people become more aware of the um, harmful effects of plastic packaging. Um, I know that plastic is really popular because it preserves food, it protects it over long distances. Um, but I think that as people are becoming more eco-conscious and demanding these more eco-friendly um, options, there has been a huge return to um, packaging that our grandmothers used to use um, and find in their grocery store. And not necessarily grandmothers, parents, people in general. Certainly, I, yeah. I, I always hear it referred to as the milkman model, uh, especially yeah. for glass. And I know that we luckily, I saw in your fridge, we have Strauss locally who provides that model, which not a lot of people have access to. Uh, and that's something that obviously we and everyone I know in this room would love to see um, you know, expand in, and with uh, other products. Thank you very much, Lily. So the next question I have is probably better for Kim. The question is, this person, they bury their compostable material in their backyard. Uh, is that the same thing as composting? Will that uh, restrict the methane release or uh, do we need to compost that material? Well, um, it won't restrict the methane release. Um, it's still a good thing to do with, with the materials, uh, it, it, much better than putting them in a landfill. Um, Commercial facilities actually have better ways and methods of, of um, managing that, uh, the emissions that are released when you compost. But having said that, a backyard compost is a great thing to have. Um, I, I've noticed though that sometimes I've done a lot of experiments in my backyard burying various items to see if they'll break down. And just burying them alone doesn't really get them to break down you actually do need to move them around and get air into them to get them to break down right. I know, I know compost cows, cows can be uh, very finicky. They don't like too much acid. They don't like to be too wet or too, too dry. Um, there's a lot of factors going in there, going on there. And uh, obviously, you know, your, if your hauler provides that service, it uh, definitely is a lot simpler, but I have plenty in Marin. We have plenty of uh, backyard composters who say, no, 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 you can't take any of my material. I'm taking care of it in my backyard. Next question on a similar vein is, at a single family home, 
what is the most uh, ecologically appropriate method to dispose of orange peels, banana peels, apple cores, and things like that. And something that I took note of that Lily mentioned um, that I don't usually think of was maybe adding that to some kind of uh, natural cleaner that you've made for a scent. And I know especially citrus is fantastic for that. Um, are there, you know, uh, in terms of disposal, Lily, how would you recommend getting rid of those things that you can't, uh, I don't know if I necessarily want my, uh, my cleaner to smell like onions, but uh, how, how might you get rid of other things like that? Yeah, I think, as you said, if you can find a way, um, even just doing a quick Google search, if you type in an item and you say, can I, is there a way to reuse X, um, you know, for cooking or cleaning, you will be surprised by the answers. I think I just saw one recently for banana peels. I forget what it was, but I think it was a cleaning pro product. So a lot of surprising things out there for um, onions. Uh, I would definitely save that for a veggie scrap stock. For orange peels, you could save it for cocktails, cooking, um, your vinegar. So I'm really trying to find creative ways to use up those scraps, and then I would eventually compost them. Excellent. And, uh, you know, in, in our kind of food waste hierarchy that we look at, there are actually priorities of, of how we want to dispose of things, right? Um, obviously, first, if we can feed people with food or feed animals with food, those are the first things we want to be doing um, on a large scale, right? Not necessarily at your home, but I know people, you know, for example, in, in West Marin, who they save their um, small scraps for chicken feed and they, they feed their animals with it or they eat it themselves, right? Because they make something else out of it. Um, you know, the, the kind of goes back to recycling being the last thing you want to do. Composting is the same thing. You know, we, it's definitely great, but there are other fantastic things that you can do with these supposed waste products. Next question is, where in the supply chain does most food waste take place? Do you think that exists on the farm, at a processing facility, at the store, in the home? Uh, and I would open that to either of you if you feel like you had, had you know, a, a great answer for it. Um, I'd let you jump, let you chime in. Kim, do you think you've uh, got a good one? Um, yeah, and I, I, I have to find, I didn't put in my presentation the link where I've got those um, uh, food waste graphics, but that was actually a, an extensive study. Again, it's another really long paper, but feel, filled with a lot of great information about that. And basically food is wasted all along the supply chain from when it um, is grown to uh, when it is uh, transported, manufactured into things, and then when it comes to us. Um, but I will, I'll find that paper and I will send it to EFM and they can send it out to all of you. I've got lots of reading for all of you if you ever get bored. Absolutely. <laughs> all right, next question. Um, this is one I really found interesting because we get, I, I hear a lot about this as well. Um, Why don't give us some guidelines, Lily, on expiration dates? I know there are use by, best by, sell by, uh, a million other things. What do those mean to me as a consumer? Are they even meant for me as a consumer? Uh, um, can you tell us about that a little bit? Yes. Okay, so first, I am not a food safety expert, so I think it's really important that everyone follows what feels most comfortable to them, but I will tell you what I do in my own home. Um, so I am a vegetarian, I do eat dairy, so, I don't worry a ton about the expiration date. I think it's, I think it's always pretty conservative is what I've read. Um, but I really, you know, for fruits and vegetables, I do it more by the feel of it. If it's starting to feel slimy, if it's starting to look wilted, um, I know that it needs to be used up very quickly. Um, for dairy products, I'm a big fan of the sniff test. Um, sometimes I'll take a little nibble. I've never gotten sick from this, knock on wood. Um, but I think it's really using your best judgment um, and realizing that a lot of those expiration dates are conservative. For dry goods, um, I'm not super concerned by them. I have had, a, you know, I'm trying to ensure that those pantry staples get rotated pretty often by as I said, shopping my pantry at home. So that helps ensure that they're staying fresh and being rotated. Um, but really the only time that I would toss something out would be uh, if I found pest inside, which has not happened to me for many years. Um, so I hope that helps. 
That definitely helps. No, there's a, a lot of, of, of good advice there. And I really uh, liked your insight on having the see through the transparent packaging, not packaging, but containers in your home to know what am I buying? How much am I buying? How much do I need to buy? Because I know a lot of times I'll be at the grocery store and think I better just buy one of these so I don't have to, you know, uh, come back. But sometimes that trip back really saves a waste of having an unopened item in your pantry. Next up, we, uh, I saw a great question in here on food waste recovery. How can we improve it, Kim? Um, uh, what, what does it look like now uh, and, and what, how can it be better? Yeah. Um, our, so I'm, I'm assuming this means uh, recovery on a large scale and not in our own home. Sure, um, that's what I would think. Well, so basically SB 1383 will actually, um, deliver the stick that 1826 delivered the carrot. <laughs> um, I, I really think that, that a lot of, of commercial businesses, um, a lot of people in general, um, they wanna do the right thing. They feel things are too costly, so they're not doing them. Um, there's a lot of great support out there. And, and again, if you're a business, reach out to your haulers. They have a lot of really amazing programs to help with that. There are a lot of good food recovery organizations out there too. Uh, I think the more aware and educated we become as a, a community, a society, the less food we will waste. Um, there, But there are ways to recover this, this food. It takes, but it does take effort and commitment. I'm really glad you mentioned uh, those two laws. I feel like, and I'm sure you understand this. That is our entire universe. It's a, uh, a lot of why I get to exist as a as a employed person is because these laws are, are very prescriptive, especially SB 1383. So uh, don't be surprised if you uh, get very familiar with your waste hauler if you uh, produce any type of organic waste. Now, next question I saw, uh, and it's kind of on this same. And for Lily, I thought you might be a, a good person to answer this one. Is what is one thing, an important thing that a small business can do to reduce waste and greenhouse gases? Our own business, um, you know, we definitely try to work with our vendors um, to ensure that um, the packaging of the products is sent as minimally as, as possible. We always try to work with them to reduce plastic packaging um, is one thing that we do. Um, and we really try to so I think oftentimes small businesses will pass the burden on to the consumer um, and the consumer will get this new product with the packaging um, and they will have to find a way to dispose of the plastic or whatever it comes in. Um, we really try to avoid that because um, we don't know what other people's waste collection situations are. We have customers from around the country, around the world. Um, so we really try to be thoughtful about um, if we do receive any sort of disposable packaging, we take the extra steps to recycle it um, and ensure that it goes into the proper um, waste stream. So that's a, just a small um, idea. I think another thing small businesses can do, um, you know, conserving energy, um, using LED bulbs, Fantastic ones. I like how they're on recycling, they're on uh, the reduction end, right, using less energy in the first place. I think another one that, um, especially with SB 1383 coming to effect, uh, people who generate edible food is donation of edible food. Um, we have some local organizations in Marin that are make it really easy to donate edible food. And like I mentioned earlier, that food waste hierarchy, you know, there are people who go every day who, who do not eat enough every single day. If that food, we would much rather have human beings eat that food and, and you know, be nourished than send that food to compost. As great of a product as compost is, um, you know, obviously we wanna make sure that people do not go hungry. And uh, you, you mentioned, both of you mentioned something I kinda wanna tie together. Uh, you said that companies pass along this responsibility to the consumer. And Kim, in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, in Europe, they passed a couple of laws that basically did the opposite. They put the responsibility onto the manufacturers, um, the people who are benefiting the most from this. And uh, it ties into a question on here, which is which international waste management ideas are most applicable to the US or into Marin and what might be a good new direction for us, Kim? Well, I, I would definitely look at the, the model that was uh, put in place in Germany. Again, it, 
it's complicated to do in the United States uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, our corporations are, are basically treated like voters, so, and lobbyists are very strong. Um, but really, this uh, break free from plastics, uh, I can't remember the, the name of the law now, but but that that's a that's a good uh, starting point. We we really need things done at the federal level. California is doing a, a lot, but guess what? Share the same air. Um, our the soil that our food grows in go the food goes everywhere. So we are all sharing the problems that we've created um, from from waste. And so I really think thinking collectively as the United States of America will help move us forward. Absolutely, uh, I completely agree with you. Um, it, uh, yeah. Next up, I uh, see a great question and here's also gonna be for Kim. Uh, it's about compostable utensils. What compostable utensils, dishware, cups can actually be composted where we are um, and what can't be composted? Well, again, the best source for that is your composter. So uh, Waste Management, uh, WM Earth Care website does have a list of things that they take and do not take. Um, I would say your best option is reusable cutlery uh, and not disposable. They do take bamboo and, and some other things. But again, bamboo is hard, really hard to break down. So the likelihood of that being skimmed um, off like the other plastic packaging is pretty high. So my, my suggestion would be don't get it. Use reusable. Um, balsa breaks down really quickly. It, it also breaks easily. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know, fiber break, fiber based products are okay. Uh, they may be acceptable, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be uh, composted at the end of that that process. Which is kind of the same thing with a lot of the compostable plastic uh, problems. Thank you very much. Um, next, what? Next up, oh gosh, I get this one all the time. Um, you know, Lily or Kim, you can jump in and answer this one. It has to do with grocery store plastic bags. Um, are they recyclable? Can I recycle that? Um, well, I could just share what I've learned. Um, so I think that plastic produce bags can be recycled and a good way to um, tell if your plastic bag is recyclable. If you can kind of press your thumb through it and it stretches, that means it's the type of plastic um, that you can drop off at your supermarket and collection sites. When you have that kind of rigid plastic that a lot of, um, that's used for a lot of food packaging. So a lot of grains and nuts that we're having to buy, um, you know, since the bulk sections are mostly closed in um, Marin and California, that kind of rigid, inflexible plastic is not recyclable. So that's just a helpful way that I can, you can tell if your plastic is recyclable. Yeah, and you mentioned something there, um, that those are generally recyclable for at-store drop-off. One thing you should almost never do is put those, uh, those flimsy plastic film, recycle, uh, plastic bags, whatever you want to call them, into your recycle can, because uh, in a residential recycling service, it's just very, very unlikely that it's going to get recycled. It's, it's uh, difficult plastic, but at the grocery store, when it's all of that type of plastic in one place, much higher likelihood it's going to get recycled. And you mentioned something that there's another question on. It's uh, about bulk sections. What's the future of bulk with the pan? One with the pandemic, but even without the pandemic, you know, let's hope that maybe in a year or two, this is behind us. You know, what is the future? It seemed like bulk had a really, um, you know, we're, we're really building up and seeing more people, more places offering things like that. Uh, what is the future now, and what is the future in the future? Well. Fingers crossed that it comes back really soon, especially as uh, COVID is, the pandemic is hopefully starting to end um, and it's becoming, you know, safer. I think a lot, as if you don't know, a lot of bulk aisles were closed due to safety concerns around COVID-19. So really crossing fingers that that comes back soon. I definitely, you know, being in the zero waste industry, it is going gangbusters, I will say. Um, bulk foods, bulk grocery delivery. Um, there's some really great local programs. One in the Bay Area is Zero Waste Grocery. They deliver food and bulk items, um, I believe, in glass jars. You can return 
So um, kind of that milkman staff service um, that is becoming super popular. And there's also a lot of package free grocery stores popping up, um, you know, all over the United States, especially in California, especially in Southern California, and hopefully um, in Northern California as well, where there just is no food packaging, it's only bulk bins, all produce is unpackaged. So I'm super hopeful and, and encouraged. I think there's a huge demand for package free groceries. And I think Hopefully, as um, you know, our safety concerns lessen, um, that uh, there will be a lot more bulk op options. Absolutely, and uh, it is definitely my hope too. I see different stores popping up, and uh, one of our questions kind of mentions a few of them uh, in Novato and in San Rafael on both of the downtown grids. I, I see two uh, zero waste shops. There are other refill shops, and it definitely makes me hopeful that that kind of uh, personality change, that lifestyle change, and habit change is becoming more pervasive. We got a few more minutes for questions, and I'm going to go up to I think Lily's probably another good one for you. Um, it has to do with gifts. Uh, gift giving can be really wasteful. I love what you said about uh, uh, giveaways and freebies. It's so hard sometimes to say no, but when it comes to gift giving and gift receiving, what are some advice that you have for our viewers on, on how to reduce just kind of those throwaway gifts? Yeah, such a great question. Um, definitely a challenge when you're living a low waste lifestyle, just because if you're living a low waste lifestyle does not mean that everyone in your life is living a low waste lifestyle. Um, and I think a lot of people, the way they show love is through gifts. So that can be very tricky. One thing I recommend is having a preemptive conversation with your family. You have that holiday coming up, the birthday's coming up, the kids' party's coming up, and you say, hey, I'm trying to do my part to reduce waste. We're trying to live more minimally. We don't have a lot of space. Um, you know, we really appreciate your generosity, but, um, you know, we would love a gift card instead, or, you know, going out for a meal together, you know, those experience uh, gifts. Um, I think offering concrete alternatives is super important. If that, if you have a family member who no matter what, they're going to bring a gift, create, you know, send them some options in advance, say, I would love this, metal dish strainer that I've had my eye on. I would love this reusable lunchbox, um, you know, that we really want. But I will say it's definitely still a challenge. I've been doing this for five years. Just last weekend, a very wonderful family member brought my son a 150 piece plastic uh, game with marbles and I thought I was gonna scream. So I always try to be gracious um, thank people for their gifts and, you know, just have those conversations and hopefully avoid those uncomfortable situations in the future. Certainly. I, I love what you said about experiences. Uh, I've, I've uh, shifted to asking for food because I know I will, that goes away. Uh, it uh, gets naturally broken down. So, you know, uh, definitely love those, uh, those ideas, um, traveling trips, those, those types of things that I, I recommend as well. It's fantastic. Um, Let's see, um, what else is left? I had a great question on, aha, grocery store recycling of bags. And I'm, I'm happy to answer this one because I actually did a little bit of research myself in looking in Novato. Um, we went to each of the grocery stores to find out what happens when we give you our plastic bags and, and truly is a way. I can tell you all about what happens. You know, I'm sure Kim can tell you all about what happens post-processing, but I don't know what happens when they take things away at the grocery store. Well. In fact, they told me that they take them back to their central processing facility, which is you know, you know, usually somewhere in Fairfield or Central California, and it's a huge warehouse. Um, and they have uh, ways that they are separating the, even the types of plastic within there because there's less value for a pink plastic bag than there is for a clear plastic bag. And so, uh, like Lily was mentioning, some of those plastic bags, when you grab every plastic bag at your house and you give it to the grocery store, some of them are not recyclable for their purposes. They all need to be about the same type of plastic. So uh, as long as they're grocery store bags, they are good to return to the grocery store. But I would be wary of just giving every single bag that you have to the grocery store and thinking, here's my solution for recycling all types of plastic film because recall a gym or in sanitary service can't take it. Uh, another question, is cellophane compostable? Kim, can you tell us what makes something compostable? Um, 
as far as I know, cellophane is not real cellophane isn't produced anymore. We, we use words like cellophane and waxed paper, waxed cartons, um, but really we're dating ourselves. <laughs> those material, those items are not a lot uh, around anymore. They are all uh, some form of, of plastic now. Um, so cling wrap, film wrap, none of, I, I wouldn't put any of those things into, into the compost. I would find, like Lily said, an alternative product that you can use. Alternatives. Nobody said zero waste was going to be easy. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a daily task. I love what Lily was saying about daily steps, right? When you take it all on at once, it's can be overwhelming, uh, but taking those little steps every day. Um, I think we probably have time for one more question. I haven't gotten the, the, the yell at me yet. So um, this one will be relatively short. Uh, and it's back for Kim. Is there a path for restaurants? And I, I touched on it a little bit. Is there a path for restaurants to distribute food waste? And are there local organizations um, that pass on edible food? Yes, there are a lot. And so I, I know um, Marine Sanitary in, in their program, um, they partner with, uh, uh, um, oh my goodness, I am blanking, Marv's organization. Extrafood.org. Extrafood.org. Oh my gosh, I just had a senior moment. Um, they partner and they, and they say, these are the things we want your, put your inedible food in your, uh, your green cart for it'll be turned into energy, but your edible food give to this other organization. And there are a lot of organizations that are out there that can accept this food. Uh, restaurants just need to be made aware that, that they exist and how to do it. And that is actually a big component of SB 1383. And there are a lot of educational resources and uh, the jurisdictions will be distributing them to the restaurants and, and the food vendors uh, as I'm should have already started that, but hey, COVID hit. <laughs> Maybe next year. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's uh, amazing to see the resources that we have here in Marin because obviously even in a place like Marin, there is hunger. Um, and it's it's hidden hunger sometimes. And they they have a, a network of volunteers that do a lot of their pickups and, and deliveries. It's a really great organization. We work uh, closely with them too. And I'm expecting to see a lot more of them with 1380, SB 1383 coming through with increased edible food diversion requirements, um, which is exciting. I'm happy to see that this food is actually getting uh, getting consumed. And with that, uh, and Christine, that seems like it's pretty close to the end of my time. Are you gonna cut me off? That's right. I was like putting myself off mute right away and then I'm gonna sneak in. But yeah, you know, I, I particularly, I think a lot of us resonate with the issue of edible food being composted because we acknowledge all the effort that went into creating that food and the fact that it's valuable and there are hungry people. So it's particularly heartbreaking when you see that get and just, you know, put in a compost bin somewhere instead of uh, recirculated to people who could use it. So thank you all, Kim, Lily, and Garen for this thoughtful and wide ranging discussion. I think. I appreciate all the time and attention that you've shared with us today. And I feel like we've all got some ideas about both the scope of the problem with waste and also some great inspiration for how we can personally reduce waste in our lives. So thank you so much. Um, so we're gonna be following up on this event in several ways. Tonight, we're gonna to send everyone a link that will have the recording to the event. It'll also have the Zoom link for the discussion tomorrow. It'll also have some additional information that Kim has been providing us with our background reading so that people be like, oh, I don't have to copy everything down from the event. I'll get it in an email. And we also have a list of actions that our sponsors have suggested for working towards reducing waste in Marin. So we hope to hear from you tomorrow. If you can come to the session at lunchtime, that would be great. And I also just wanted to say, oh yes, so here's our list of action items that we'll be receiving in the email from our sponsors. Please take a look at these. These are great ideas and they're very appropriate to what we've been discussing today. So I just wanted to wrap up by saying we appreciate all of you, speakers, sponsors, and those of you in the audience for coming together to increase our understanding of the impact of our consumption patterns and the opportunity to change them into more conscious choices. So thank you everybody and have a great evening. Take care. Bye-bye.